still in Europe, still in UK. This time we are in York, a town full of chocolate shops and factories, where we meet Sophie, one of the first chocolate maker of Europe. Hello guys, welcome back to Chocozone. We are still in uh, UK, but this time we, we have uh, a lady and we are very happy for this in our podcast. And uh, she is uh, Sophie Jewett, the owner of your Cocoa House. Hello. Hi Sophie. Hello. How do you, how do you say that? Sophie or Sophie? Oh, do you know what? When the Italians say it, you can say it however you like. It sounds very romantic. <laughs> okay. Like our English, so sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> we can say it. Uh, sorry for our English, please. So, no, normally, no, please don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> normally, we ask our guests to introduce uh, um, themselves, and so we have to do the same with you. Mm, please tell us a little summary of your life uh, with your background before that you you start with the, with a passion for chocolate. And was always very interested to learn more about the things that we eat and kind of how things were made. But that wasn't so easy with chocolate. But um, it wasn't until I came to York uh, to study as a student um, many years ago now. And um, the city smelt of chocolate. And um, one of the reasons I think I chose the city was because it had this chocolate making heritage and um, that all of these big famous names in the chocolate industry had come from the city. So I came to York and I studied and then I worked in the food and drink industry, um, but in fine food and working in food history and organizing weddings and banquets and um, working with um, single origin ingredients. And then I first started working with the slow food movement, which um, started in Italy and celebrated the origin of food and how foods were grown. And that for me was a really interesting kind of relationship with the fact that I'd grown up on a farm um, in the south of England and had grown up really kind of being fascinated by how foods grew and kind of just how amazing they tasted when you tasted these things that had been ripened by the sun or had been grown properly. And that for me was, um, I just thought it was really crazy how like so much of the food we get supplied in our um, food industry through restaurants or through um, supermarkets here really doesn't taste like the original ingredients when you kind of are eating them fresh or have been made by really amazing craftspeople. So um, it was really that that kind of inspired me to kind of bring these interests and ideas and passion that I had together with this landscape of York and chocolate and um, try and bring something together and kind of explore chocolate a bit better. Yeah, and um, in which way do you uh, discover the bean to bar production and how you you started to, to think about uh, to, to do from yourself? Yeah, so I first came across the story of Amy Singh who had been um, making chocolate in America and I think it was through like Chloe Dutra Russell's book The Chocolate Connoisseur's Guide to Chocolate bit tasting that I really fell in love with the idea of being able to explore these flavors in cocoa and chocolate like you tasted in wine and um, I'd come from having um, managed a lot of like fine wine type events so kind of was very interested in exploring flavor um, in a lot more detail and then I kept trying to access those sorts of chocolates and um, it was just impossible to get hold of those here in the UK. And at that sort of time, you could see what was happening in America with a number of chocolate makers starting up in America. So when we first opened um, our first chocolate house, the York Cocoa House, that was nearly 10 years ago. And in York, we kind of, the lots and lots of ideas of things that we wanted to explore, but the, the bean to bar sector wasn't really that established here in Europe at the time. And so it was really kind of like, let's start developing a relationship with the customer. Let's start telling this story about York and its chocolate history. But kind of, I always wanted to start going into this journey of exploring the bean to bar sector 
but unfortunately here in York we're kind of in the shadow of a really really big chocolate factory and so there is no shortage of people ready to tell you what to do or how not to do it so um, it was kind of like we had lots of lots of things that we had to work around and learn and sometimes figure out for ourselves and sometimes work with those people that had kind of been there and done that but we were obviously very keen not to be making chocolate in the same way that they were. I see. Um, your Cocoa House was born by crowdfunding, isn't it? No, so actually York Cocoa House um, was started by myself. So okay. I kind of had a little bit of money left over from paying off a loan and um, managed to get some support from the bank and started it off myself. But then we crowdfunded about four years ago to build our chocolate factory here. So York Coco Works, we're still the same company, um, but we designed and built the factory. And for that, we had the help of lots of people within the industry. Um, and I went to visit yourselves and yeah. you welcomed me to the, your factory yeah. there at Milan. And um, it was great, really, to have the support of so many people in the industry and particularly here in York that were really, really kind in sharing their knowledge and also wanted to make a contribution and be part of that journey. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I guess that chocolate is one of the best way to grow funding. I mean, it's something that everybody wants to invest in. Um, I mean, it's been been really really interesting through lockdown we have had so many people reaching out to us wanting to learn on our chocolate courses so we start those again here in about two weeks time um we're going to be able to start them again but it's been really interesting so many people wanting to start businesses so it's really great to see that the whole sector is starting to gather momentum now and enthusiasm from people like really keen to explore it further uh, back to the production of chocolate, um, tell us uh, how, how do you make uh, in, uh, in your factory? How do you create uh, from the cocoa beans your, your chocolate? So we have um, two, two quite distinct processes here that we use. So we have the stone grinders um, that do our like 30 kilo small batches, but we also have um, one of the traditional um, manufacturing designs for a refiner conch uh, method with a long conch um, that we use for our dark chocolate recipes. Um, so everything is behind glass, so everybody can see the whole production process. Um, and we've been trying to, I'm really passionate about making foods accessible to people and engaging kind of so people get to know what's gone on in their foods and we've obviously here in the UK have seen like a quite a high demand for chocolates that are free from dairy ingredients and not necessarily just for like a vegan diet but kind of more people really kind of wanting to know what goes on in in the making process so we have just one machine who that makes our milk chocolate products so like our white and our milk chocolate um, and then we have another machine that we use to make liquor and another machine that we use, so the refiner conch to make our dark chocolate products. I see. One of the most uh, fascinating things about Bean to Bar is that you normally want to show your process. As you say, you have windows, everybody can see it. But you made, I mean, I think uh, one step forward because you, you make your visitors, your customer in your Cocoa Academy to make the chocolate. So can you tell us something about that? So, like, so I grew up on a small farm in the south of England and um, over the course of like my life and career, I've seen the food sector um, become more and more devalued and become more and more commercialized. And so by becoming a small chocolate maker, it was really about trying to encourage people to understand and appreciate what goes on in the production of the things that we eat. And um, hopefully for them to enjoy the things that they eat more and really make a conscious decision about the things that we choose to spend our money on, the community it engages with, and those people that we get to share that money with um, as consumers. So that was really important to us. And, um, Having worked in food and drink all of my career, I'm really conscious that um, it's, it's a sector where the, the staff, the labor, it's really undervalued in the whole production process. And obviously we need machinery, but kind of it's very easy to try and grow 
a company by just buying robots to, to do the process. And whereas for us, we really need to have to be hands on and develop that skill and expertise. So for us, we wanted people to really have the chance to appreciate what they were doing or what they were buying into. So we invite people to come here and um, have a go making their own. And I really wanted to try and encourage people to have that ownership and relationship with the food that they eat and kind of really just have some appreciation for what goes on in consuming uh, what we hope is good food. And the other uh, positive part of the Bean to Bar is that in some way, by having the connection directly with the farmers, you do support them. How do you feel your company uh, does help these farmers? In which way do you think, do you feel it? Well, I think there is still so much work to do in that regard. Um, so for me, like I'm a big believer in what's called the circular economy. And that's pretty much what underpins our business model. And that is about trying to build direct relationships between consumers and producers. So if we think about the chocolate supply chain and just how many people are typically involved with so much of the commercially available chocolate, it doesn't really share or distribute value effectively in a way that the farmers get to feel part of that reward or that consumers get to enjoy and benefit from. So like so many people in that production process, everyone is trying to take a cut out of it. And that was really kind of what we were trying to try and reorganize by the consumers being able to have um, a relationship with what they're consuming. And to be honest, I st we have so much more work to do to be able to have the relationships that we really want to support and create. And obviously, we've seen so many traders and communities and farmers sharing their cocoa material. But for us, we really want to try and create a model where if we get to earn more money from the cocoa that somebody has invested so much energy in creating a great product with, we want to try and find a way of sharing that value back with that community rather than it just being a transactional relationship and it's all about supply and demand chains. Yeah. So um, that's kind of what I'm really quite keen to try and find ways of doing that. And obviously technology now is coming out to help us try and create that relationship so that consumers can sort of see I value this cocoa quality, or I value this flavor, or I value this variety, or this origin, or how these farmers have looked after their cocoa beans. So I think we're, we're really just getting to the edge of having some agreement of what that quality looks like in the cocoa supply chain. And I think I'm really grateful for so many people that have helped to try and create that as a conversation and share their process for us to understand so much more about what's happening in that process. Yeah, the, the, the chocolate maker are a little bulb for uh, some farmers and uh, for, for a lot of years they, they have been uh, under the big feet of the majors. Uh, what is the different approach, according to you, that uh, the chocolate makers could have uh, with the farmers? Uh, the differences between the, the chocolate makers and the big companies? Um, I think we've got such an opportunity to redefine the way that consumers perceive chocolate and I think that's going to be really different for us here in the UK than it is for you in Italy because you're I mean you're so you're really you're, you're talking to an audience that understand origin of food or artisan craftsmanship and like for us in the UK there's been a lot of people kind of we're seeing growth in regional beers for example and different flavors in coffee so for us though in the uk it's about distribution of product can we get access to those markets and kind of engage those consumers and that's been a conversation that we've been passionate about sharing with our customers and it's not necessarily always the most commercially viable or has the immediate return but i have to say like we're still here 10 years on So I think we've seen so many more consumers understand and engage with kind of that chocolate could be different than just the, the, the Kit Kat chocolate bar, which is what our city is famous for. But it's a very much it's a standardized chocolate and trying to understand that there's different flavors in 
cocoa, different ways of making chocolate, different cultures have different ways of doing it, different production processes have different ways of experiencing that product. And I think there's so much more to explore than just how people have been used to understanding chocolate to be. Uh, England has been one of the very first country where the bean to bar developed a lot. But uh, USA, we can say that the big hit in that, uh, in that sense, with the to bar development of new chocolate makers and things like that, has been one of the very first, probably the first big development. Uh, what do you think, which is the main difference between that market, the US to bar chocolate making market, and the UK, if there is any? I th well, I think, I mean, I can only really speculate in terms of like the US. Um, obviously, in the UK, we can have a very easy national reach because we are a small island, after all, um, that kind of has the ability to kind of, I can send things off. Um, and whilst my family live on another island at the other end of the country, I can send something off from here and it reach them tomorrow. So like that, that obviously gives us a great proximity to our customers. And um, so I think we're small enough, but big enough to be able to kind of have this as a, a joined up conversation as a country. Like we all exist in the same time frame, And that must be very challenging for kind of people trying to do business in the US. Um, but also you've got a lot more differences in climate in the US. Um, um, like in York, like we're here used to wet days and cold days. So like the whole country has a... A, a ripe chocolate consuming uh, climate here, um, mm. which I think it kind of um, gives us that background. But also I think like, because the, the UK is quite used to having what some might call bad chocolate, and like, because the, the industry has overly commercialized mm -hmm. and has the, these kind of confectionery brands that, yeah. um, that have kind of gone global to some extent, but we would perceive fine chocolate to be Italian or Swiss or French or Belgian. Mm. And like where we do have a lot of heritage here, and that's one of the things that I was very much inspired by in York is just, and we've been, we've been making historic chocolate recipes here today. So uh, we're looking at doing some new workshops um, moving forward. And like some of the flavors are really, really amazing. But obviously, they industrialized to make it cheaper, faster. So we kind of have lost a lot of that quality uh, in what we're used to consuming here. About your production or your product, you just mentioned uh, about the chocolate. Which are, do you think, the peculiarities of your products and uh, why you can sell everywhere? And what are the peculiarities that are more appreciated by the consumers? So we're trying to explore and share a lot more of what we um, engage with, with the origins of the cocoa. So we've developed our own way of connecting in with some of the, the cocoa and chocolate um, tasting frameworks that have been developed around quality and sharing that quality. So for us, it's about trying to share with our customers exactly what's gone on in our chocolate making process. Um, we've learned a lot and I didn't realize quite how much more there would be to learn. Um, just even about each bean variety, when you start working with a bean variety and um, as well as through our own production process. So it's, I have to sometimes just focus and make sure we're supporting for like continual improvement in what we're doing. Um, but it can be very easy to want to keep experimenting and change and perfect recipes. But sometimes it's not for several months afterwards that you, you can kind of really taste the flavors coming through and appreciate that, that quality. So there's a lot that we still need to achieve here. Uh, which is your best selling bar, for example? Well, we're here in the UK. So milk chocolate is very much one of our, okay. uh, our top selling chocolates. Um, so my favorite one is our Uganda 45% milk chocolate. Okay. So uh, I'm really pleased. Milk chocolate? Wow. Um, where do you sell? The, and which channel are you using to, to sell? 
And another question, uh, uh, with the coronavirus, I know that uh, a lot of things are changing, uh, and uh, how is uh, your, your the, the, the web system for your company? How do you sell also abroad uh, thanks to the, the web? So tell us about it. Well, here in York, we York is one of the most visited cities outside of Edinburgh and London here in the UK. So we have been very used to our customers coming to us. And um, so, of course, a year ago, that caused a lot of problems for us um, mm -hmm. when visitors were no longer coming. Um, and then everything opened up in the summer and all of our customers came back. And that was okay. It, so we've kind of had a lot of stopping and starting over the course of the last year. Um, one of the things that we decided to do was not put our energy into distributing to other customers as wholesale clients because we knew that they were going to have the same challenges that we were having and we yeah. needed to make sure we could work and put our energy into improving what we were doing. So we have focused on improving our factory and focusing on quality and being more effective in what we're making and having relationships with those customers who have engaged with us online. So that has been like we've worked very closely with our local community and um, we have a cycle delivery service who takes our chocolate out to look after people in our local community. So that has been very, very positive. And then um, we have had all of the big gift giving seasons to focus on. So obviously Christmas, Valentine's, Mother's Day in the UK and Easter is that other big season for us here in York and the UK. So um, we have very much focused on being able to send um, thousands of parcels out from our facility across the UK and sometimes abroad. But um, I have to say, Brexit has made it, of course, a bit more challenging to send to our clients in Europe. But we've been working through that too. Um, talking about the, um, the competitions or the awards, that you, I know that you won some awards, International Chocolate Award and uh, British competition. Um, how do you feel that this may be helpful for a chocolate maker, for a small company or also a big company? This is something useful? Yeah, so I so we've not um, we've not entered or won anything with the International Chocolate Awards. We were very appreciative. We um, had received some highly commended with the Academy of Chocolate Awards last year, um, which was a big, big honor for us because obviously very kind of highly esteemed organizations. Um, historically, though, we did sponsor the International Chocolate Awards and helped establish the UK competition. Yeah. And um, uh, Umberto has had oh, a very, 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 And um, I believe that to start with, we are all working together. Sure. And um, we have different tastes. Like I have different tastes on different days of the week and different times of the day. So for me, it is not about the best chocolate. And it is not about being better than another chocolate maker because we aim to be better than ourselves all the time. That is my, I think I, I am my biggest competition uh, in terms of what we do. But I do think obviously by having that recognition and communication and having ways that we can understand the difference between creating and how a quality experience is created and showcasing that and sharing it And also being um, proud of the achievements of our colleagues within the industry is yeah. how we can try and support each other to create sustainable businesses. Because it's taken me 10 years for us to try and get close to having a sustainable business here. And um, that is only because of the 
the friendship and camaraderie that we have with others in the industry. And so I think that there is, it's not about having a ranking of best to worst in that way, because obviously I am here in a city like York and we have all of these bigger confectionery and chocolate companies around us um, who've been here for hundreds of years. And but we all work with cocoa and yeah. we all work to give enjoyment to other people. And I feel like we, we are here as a chocolate maker or a chocolate creator. And whether you um, temper chocolate and put it in a packet or whether you create a big chocolate bar that goes and sells around the world, ultimately we, we all want our industry to be better. And that's why I think like we're working together in that way. So I think the awards um, are a very, a very constructive thing for us to all understand. But we're not going to all agree on what we think good is because and neither should we because we all have different tastes and that's yeah. kind of very much what we're about is being able to help people um explore and discover th and appreciate their own taste in things and explore flavor in a way that we don't always have the chance to explore flavor um in what we eat if particularly if we only eat what we know or what we like in that way so i think there's some, been some really really positive um kind of it's helped definitely helped get those companies that have continued to invest in sustainability and improvements in their process and you can without a doubt you can taste that progress when you kind of have the opportunity to enjoy those products yeah. I, I think that international chocolate award is a, a big help uh, to to the little crafters and uh, the, the, the big company has a lot of channel to arrive to the customers and uh, to have uh, a recognize from from somebody from an academy it is important to try to to create a marketing or on your brand if you are a little company and uh, if you need uh, also a little support as, uh, about uh, how to make your chocolate because they could also say to you oh this is uh, to change and uh, and this is important Yes, we know that not uh, everybody <laughs> think the same, but uh, <laughs> but um, uh, when I I received a, a request to to be a sponsor of International Chocolate Award, I say suddenly yes, because uh, I don't want to say that I am against the big companies because I work also with them, but I I love the the little chocolate makers, the, the different tests that you can find only with the, those kind of, uh, of chocolate. As a chocolate maker, you can have also indications, you know, on how to improve or how to get better. The, the, the sense of... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've been very lucky. Like, like I, I don't work in our factory um, because when I go in, I make a big mess. <laughs> and um like i'm always trying to improve things whereas like my team they they're amazing and like they 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 make things the the same and they can deliver that consistency and like the challenge with chocolate making is that every single stage is the most important stage and it's like that's like everything that you've got to focus on quality wise so like I can't focus on every single stage unless my team are able to understand that quality so for us to have so we're, we're very kind of interested in exploring these different dimensions of ingredients and flavors and process so for us we kind of want to keep a real open mind which is why sometimes it's like okay we just need to keep making this recipe because that's what our customers have got used to and customers don't like change all the time and they kind of come back we have customers that come in asking for products that we sold eight years ago and we kind of like well we've not sold that for eight years but kind of like it's and but I I'm pleased that you have that relationship with us in delivering that product but I think the um, I mean in being involved with the awards so we used to um, because I used to do a lot with fine dining and know so many in the industry in the city and the region we, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to support the development of the awards here in the UK and um, it's when you taste 
a gold award winning chocolate in any of these things it's like your whole mindset can be opened to really experiencing what an amazing quality product is and when you have the chance to to taste those products you sort of like okay this is something to aspire to create and that and they really do stand out when you have the opportunity to try those um and i think it's it's good to always have those uh, role models yeah. to kind of engage with in that way yeah. uh, sophie we we have quite uh, at the end uh, of, uh, of this episode and uh, i like to everybody i ask to you how do you see your company in 2030 and how do you see the bin to bar movement within the next 10 years um i think it will really take off and go much more like how we've seen wine and coffee going in terms of like consumer understanding and uh, actually consumers kind of really having an opportunity to be more actively involved um so that's how i hope it will go but i think we're going to see so many more chocolate makers coming from africa and kind of origin growing countries um that and i think we will see a shift in production because um, it obviously it makes more sense to be making something closer to origin. And that's definitely something that we really want to support and encourage um, through sharing our knowledge and experience. Um, because otherwise it's, it's much, more, much too wasteful um, for us to be shipping these, these beans all across the world all the time. So um, those are the things that I think we will see happen. And I also think that in that same context, we will see more countries reclaiming their own identity and ownership in cocoa and i think it's through that sharing experience that i think we have the ability to reimagine what globalization could be like mm -hmm. um and kind of learn from sometimes the not so good impacts that we've seen over the last 20 30 years so i hope that we can keep being um imaginative and keep exploring and keep sharing with customers what's happening in that world of cocoa and chocolate and keep being able to be imaginative in how we share our flavors and preferences and those relationships that we have through our supply chain um, with our customers. Um, so I don't know that I want to have a bigger factory now. This has kind of been quite a step for us. Um, but kind of I really want to be able to explore more of those cultures and uh, relationships and stories. Great. Okay, Sophie. Well, thank you a lot for uh, your time. And, we uh, hope yeah. to see and meet again. Uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Sooner or later. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I have to say your equipment is proudly in our factory here. And it has been helping us scale up our production and uh, helping make our Easter eggs this, uh, this Easter. But um, no, thank you for your continued support for all of us. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time, Sophie. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you very much.